You're now watching the Mike Missinelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another week of the Mike Missinelli Podcast brought to you by Bet Rivers. I believe it's Podcast 194, 195. We kind of lost count. It's up to you guys to recount because I'm an idiot and I lose count all the time. So if you want to email me on what this actually is, the number, that'd be great. They'd be very helpful. In any event, we're doing it on Tuesday, June 11th. Uh, my bets are looking pretty secure with the Bet Rivers app as I took the Boston Celtics a couple times already, including for them to win the series, which I believe is a foregone conclusion. So uh, after this NBA season, what you'll have to bet on is baseball. I don't know how many people bet baseball, but you also have some golf. You got the U.S. Open coming up. And then, of course, football season. And everybody loves to bet and looks at the lines uh, and the over-unders and the players involved and the fantasy football. All that's coming our way and we get through this summer. It's kind of just the beginning of summer. So let's kick it off with a little football talk because we haven't really delved in to the Eagles that much. And a couple of issues popped up in minicamp uh, with the Eagles with, with uh, various statements being made by Philadelphia Eagle players. Now, the first one that was made was by Brandon Grant who when asked, and, uh, and then he, he tried to back off it by saying, hey, you, don't you guys get me in trouble. Uh, but he said the reason why that they failed last year is because coaches were not in the right position. Now, I don't know if that was an indictment of Nick Sirianni or, or the specific coaches, but at the end of the day, the head coach has the responsibility of putting coaches in the right position. And if the players didn't think they were in the right position, they, that was an error by the head coach. But let's move on to the big one. Jalen Hurts, um, you know, I look at Jalen Hurts in a lot of ways that I looked at Chase Utley. He's a wackadoo. He's, he's kind of a, 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 an odd, uh, detached type of guy who's been programmed like a robot to say certain things. And really no personality comes out of Jalen Hurts. Now, I guess that's okay. If your quarterback is a really good player, who cares what his personality is? Uh, and I don't really care. Every It's to each his own on... What kind of personality you're going to be as, as long as you produce with a certain personality? Who am I to judge that you don't really have a personality? But Jalen Hurts really doesn't. Uh, so uh, let's look at the, the, the interview of Jalen Hurts after a minicamp session. And he was asked about Nick Sirianni and the new coaching style being opened up to change the offense, and I think it was a reporter trying to get Hertz to give Sirianni a compliment. Oh, look at this guy. He's willing to change after what happened last year, and isn't that wonderful? Hoping or thinking that the answer that would come back from the quarterback would be, yeah, you just it's amazing why how he's adapted and blah, 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 blah. And instead, the, the opposite came through. And, uh, and so the question was, what does that say about him? And Hurt says, well, that's a great question. I don't know how to answer it. And then there was a follow-up, and he says something like, um, I think he's been great in the messages he's delivering to the team, trying to be very intentional on what he's saying. What? What the F does that mean? It doesn't even mean anything. So let, let's get to the actual answer, the actual audio uh, from Jalen Hurts when when asked these questions about Nick Sirianni. So what have you noticed about you know Nick being open minded to change up every you know the offense like he has? I mean, what's that say about him? Um, I mean, it's a great question. I don't know that I know the answer to it. But what have no. you seen? What have you seen from him as far as doing that? Um, I think he's just you know he's been a you know, great and, um, you know, the, the messages he's delivering to the team. Um, he's trying to be very intentional in what he's saying. Um, and, yeah. All right. Uh, that's really odd. Uh, I got to tell you. Now, a lot of people would chastise the media for not asking the follow-up question. And there's really one follow-up question that should have been asked, which is, Gee, Jalen, that didn't sound like a ringing endorsement for your head coach. Is there some kind of miscommunication going on with you guys? Now, he probably won't answer that question the way you want it 
but it's probably a question that needs to be asked. That is a very odd answer from the quarterback, and it tells me one thing. And I don't think I'm being over the top when I say this, that it's telling me one thing. It's telling me that Jalen Hurts really doesn't think that much of Nick Sirianni. That's what it's telling me. And, and if the head, if the quarterback doesn't think much of the head coach, then what do you got? If any two men should be on the same page, it's the quarterback and it's the head coach. Uh, so let me just give you, and I'll bring Darren in in a second for this because he's got something to say uh, a lot about the, what the media didn't ask. But let me just give you my personal opinion. This has nothing to do with Jalen Hurts. I don't know what Jalen Hurts thinks of Nick Sirianni. I only know what I think of Nick Sirianni. And I think Nick Sirianni is a buffoon. I, I, I've always thought this. Now, obviously, when you go to the Super Bowl, it backs you off a little bit. But when I looked at what happened last year, where they lost six of their last seven games, where he panicked, with the offensive, uh, the defensive coordinator change, where he was powerless to sell the seams that were coming apart with the Philadelphia Eagles. And at the end of the year, I was stunned that he kept his job. And the only reason he kept his job, in my opinion, is because Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman introduced him as the new shiny toy. That they had found this guy through the crevices, and their expertise determined that this guy is the next hot young coach. And that's the only reason they didn't fire him. But by the same token, they said, listen, Nick, we weren't really pleased with what you did last year. So here's the deal. You're now going to have to accept this head coaching job with our changes. And we're going to change every one of your damn coaches. We're going to select an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator. And you're going to have to live with it and make it work. And if you can't make it work or that's distasteful to you, well, then I think we should part ways. Now, Sirianni's a young guy. Was he going to part ways? Where's he going to go? So he says, oh, oh, sure, sure, Jeffrey, sure. And, and so that's how he keeps his job. My sense is... This is not going to work out very well for Nick Sirianni. And by the end of the season, he won't keep his job. He, he will finish the season. I think it will be a change in the offseason. I know there's a lot of people out there. Mike, you're always looking for hot takes. I don't look for hot takes. I look, I look at what, what I saw. I saw a team fall completely apart with a head coach unable to manage the falling off the cliff. And if I see that, I go, this guy is not worthy. This guy can't figure out what the hell's going on. He had a good team early. He watched it fall apart. He panicked. He, he had no remedy to fix the whole problem with the Philadelphia Eagles. And the season turned into a disaster. Now, if that's somebody who needs to keep his job, then I don't know shit about sports. All right? So let's bring in producer Darren for his take on this. Darren, start with the... Your, your, your dislike of what, how the media approached the Jalen Hurts comments. Well, uh, Mike, I thought it was an incredible answer to the question. Absolutely incredible. My jaw hit the floor. I can't believe it was an incredibly disrespectful answer. And you're a leader of the, this is the so-called leader of the team in the locker room, on the field. And you answer a question that basically, in so many words, says, I, I don't know what the hell the head coach does. I'm not interested in what the coach does. And not one media member pressed him on that. I, I would have had a hundred. I, I, in my mind, I had a hundred questions. I know you. And you're the first person I thought there's really, of. There's, listen, there's really only one question. You don't have to have a hundred questions. You say, geez, Jalen, that did not sound like a ringing endorsement of your head coach. Is there something we should know about this? That's the follow-up. And, and no one asked that or anything like it to press him on that. I can't believe no one's in the media has really – I don't really have been a lot of opportunities to talk to anyone else, but they certainly have had an opportunity to talk to Sirianni since then. And no one has really asked for some clarity on what Jalen may or may not have meant there. There is – that is not a good thing. This, this could very well – and look, you and I do not do hot takes. It was the first thing we decided on when you know when you wanted to start doing this, this podcast. 
that that's bad. That is a red flag, Mike. That's a red flag as to what's going on, here, particularly here, because one this can was make an here. issue of concern last season. There are two conclusions you can make here. Number one is there's the, the, a serious divide between the head coach and the quarterback, and the quarterback doesn't really respect right. him. Or two, Jalen's just a spaceman. <laughs> and so when he gives an answer like, yeah. uh, um, uh, I think he's been great in the messages he's delivering to the team, trying to be very intentional in what he's saying. What the freak does that even mean? That doesn't even mean he, trying to be very intentional in what he's saying – what does that mean? I don't even know what intentional means. What do you mean? You, what, so, so is there another I, way? Of, I go, Jalen's just a, a, a wackadoo, or, or I, like he's hiding something that he doesn't want to say. He really isn't on board with his head coach. There's, there's, it's very clear to me that there is that things are not all smooth and comfortable in that locker room. and They weren't last year, and I think you're going to see – and this is not just me blurting shit out here. Like, I think you're going to see that ripple effect continue because that was supposed to be nipped in the bud. This all, all that BS was supposed to have gone away when they brought in new coordinators. And, you know, I, I almost feel like Sirianni's a lame duck here already. Well, we'll see what happens. Just for a, a replay of last year. In case you want to relive this, the guy who did having to do a post game show uh, every game uh, last year, um, they they were they were getting by in games. They're being pressed. They had, they won a couple games by the skin of the teeth, including the Buffalo Bills game, which probably they should have lost. But they follow that up when the 49ers take their soul at forty two nineteen. Then the Cowboys take their soul thirty three thirteen. Now it is there on that airplane that either. Lori and Roseman had a conversation with Sirianni saying, hey, you know, it might might be a, a, a good idea for, for us to look at the coordinators. I believe that happened. I believe that they put the idea in Sirianni's head, which is when, uh, like, Alan King in, uh, in the movie Casino said, uh, uh, when, when, the, when the big guy says you want to step away, that means uh, you better run. Uh, and so maybe that was what led Sirianni to change his uh, his defensive coordinators, or maybe Sirianni was just stupid enough to think that that was a good idea, which it was not. Because then we had the uh, Seahawks in uh, the first game with the, with the Patricia as defensive coordinator. They win 2017. They squeak past the Giants. They should have lost that game. They win it. Then they lose to the Cardinals. And right there, it's blown. Now the seams are almost all a part of your sweater, right? And that's where a head coach has to come in and start weaving it back. Uh, a head coach that knows what he's doing. Instead, what happens? He loses to the Giants 27-10. to 10, And they go into the playoffs with a hell of a lot of momentum where they get smoked by a mediocre Tampa Bay team. Now, if you review that, and in your, in your honest of honest opinions... At that moment, how could you possibly think that that head coach could have kept his job well, or should have kept his job? And a lot of people thought he should have. At the time, I said, this is a foregone conclusion. There is no way you can bring this guy back who presided over that kind of unraveling at the end of a football season from what was a good team that were on their way to a, a premier playoff slot. Mike, I think the only so, reason he still has the job, I think you're I think you're a little off. I think you're in the right church, but wrong pew. I think he was told. I think Laurie and Roseman, who are both very meddling owners and general manager, I think they said, they made that decision for him to change the coordinator, and it didn't work out, and that's why he still has his job, because that was well, their decision. it's possible that they did that. We have no evidence of that. No, He's taken that's ownership pure of speculation. That. I'm saying, I, I just said, I suggested that both of those guys did that. Uh, but I'm also evaluating the other side, that if it was a Sirianni move, then that's an idiotic, all right? So, I, I got you. So there we stand with your Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and this is the storyline now that has been, you know, the pump has been primed for this storyline. <laughs> if they get off to a bad start, you know, it, it's going to Syria, it's going to fall in Syria instead of Kellen Moore. Uh, so we'll just have to keep our eye on that. A subplot for the Philadelphia Eagles. I, I don't know whether to be optimistic or pessimistic going to the season. I'm probably somewhere in between where, uh, 
I look at the, the personnel that they've added, and I said they've done a good job in a, a lot of areas. There's still uh, uh, like too many guys in the defensive backfield that I don't know who they're going to play. So I feel uncertain about that, even though they have a lot of players. So uh, we'll just happen to see what goes on with the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, let's move on to baseball on the Mike Messinelli podcast, the London series. Well, a lot of days have been eaten up for two games. I got, I got to be honest with you. A lot of days, Thursday, Friday, then you get the games on Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday, and then no, finally, oh, finally the season resumes. You know, with that many days off and you know, two games that were against a crappy team like the Mets, I, I don't know how much this energized the, the Phillies. Now they come back from, from the, that jet-laggy type of trip, and they, they play the Boston Red Sox, a pretty good team. So uh, we shall see what happens in this next series. There's no room for panic because the Phillies are the best team in baseball right now. All right, so I, I'm not even trying to to panic here. But let's just look at the, the the London series. You know, those guys got out to Trafalgar Square. They went to a pub and hung out. You know, for the most part, they they enjoyed their trip. They got a little culture. Baseball players and culture usually don't mix. But here they are in London, uh, taking in the sights. And of course, uh, Bryce Harper does the soccer slide. Uh, as a as a uh, 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 example of showmanship, uh, he's the showman. I get it, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm listening to the broadcast, two broadcasts. One was the Fox broadcast, the other was the ESPN broadcast. And we talked to Kirchin and Glanville in our last podcast, and um, uh, uh, Michael K was the uh, play-by-play guy. Uh, I like the fact that you can wake up and see a baseball game, like on Sunday morning. It's like like the old days when I used to get up and watch Wimbledon. So, like, at 10 o'clock, here's the game one, and that really is, like, six hours later in London. So, they're playing that in the middle of the afternoon at Wembley Stadium. And so, I like the fact that was on. Um, the Fox broadcast, uh, I thought, was uh, you know, A.J. Pruszynski and Adam Wainwright actually had the audacity to say the Mets, who are eight games under 500, by the way, are close. They're close. <laughs> I go, what? Close to what? Close to the sun? Like Icarus? Where they're going to get burned up? <laughs> Close? They stink. What are you kidding me? Man, how, could you, how could you not be honest about the New York Mets when you see that awful gosh damn team trying to play the Phillies with Lindor, who was a superstar who now is, is an afterthought. Mailed it in, yeah. They're close to what? Yeah. They're not close to anything. And he's saying, well, they shouldn't trade their players because they're close. Uh, dude, <laughs> you couldn't be further from the truth. And, you know, AJ Pruszynski usually calls it like he sees it. Wainwright is still chummy chummy. Yeah, and he's new in the business. But, but Brzezinski has been in a lot of trouble in his major league career for being outspoken. Had the audacity to say the Mets are close? <laughs> Come on now. Don't insult me. All right? Oh, God. Yeah, that crew's right. bad. Anyway, uh, the two guys that got hosed, Brandon Marsh got hosed. He was left here. Who else was left here? Who else didn't go? Uh, Turner actually went. Uh, they should not have brought oh, Wheeler. Oh, uh, Clemens didn't go. Yeah. Cody Clemens, it? yeah. All right, so uh, sorry for those guys, man. I would, you know, I, I would have gone. Why not? You get rehab, go to London. The free trip to London. Well, I'm surprised it. that like, Wheeler went. That to those guys? Yeah, I know they want Wheeler out there for the press and whatnot, but Wheeler and whoever tomorrow's starter is, uh, I don't think they needed to go through the jet lag BS. Uh, I would have, I would have. Wheeler didn't come out, apparently. Wheeler didn't uh, join any festivities. He stayed in his room most of the yeah. time. What was the point of so, having him there? Why go through the jet lag? I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, let's move on to the uh, another current event that, that just uh, happened, just broke, that Danny Hurley turned down the Lakers. I think Danny Hurley played him. You know, I, I would probably do the same thing. It, it feels good to be wanted by somebody. Uh, maybe another NBA team takes notice a couple of years down the road that he was interested in the NBA. So he, he really had nothing to lose. And I thought for the Lakers to get him, they were going to have to. I, I gave you the salaries, the highest pr- uh, priced coaches in the league right now. And I said the Lakers are going to have to get close to $20 million a year to, to blow. To, he's got to be made the highest paid coach in the league for them to lure him away from UConn. So he listened to him. And they offered uh, 11.12 or something like that. 
And he says, nah, you guys are going to give me a new contract where I'm going to make seven in the stores, Connecticut. I'm not in L.A. Cost of the living's perfect for me. I can go to the NBA in a couple of years. I don't have to deal with the LeBron situation and the whole Lakers situation. So I think Danny Hurley, I think Danny Hurley got back on that plane from L.A. after hearing the pitch and went... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just played. He was like Muttley the dog. <laughs> oh, I can't even do it. But that's what, <laughs> that's what he was. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just played the Lakers. <laughs> you think I'm going there? You got to be kidding. All right. So, anyway, so, so Danny, I hope you win another national championship. And then two years later, you'll take it some job. You're not going to take it in LA. I see Danny Hurley as a guy who's not an LA guy. Like, he'll take it as some other thing. Like, and, and get paid just as handsomely. All right, NBA playoffs are still going on. Uh, the Boston Celtics, uh, this, it, I, it could be a sweep. i got to be honest with you. you know, the Dallas Mavericks are a nice team, and they've surprised a lot of people, and they use defense to get through that West. But you can't use defense against the Boston Celtics when they have five guys can shoot three at any time. You just can't defend them. You can't. You can't double and, and 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 you can't blitz them and you know, all, all these concepts that that make that made those two teams uh, the minnesota timberwolves and the uh uh dallas mavericks good was the defense the ability to blitz and get the ball out of certain people's hands well you get the ball out of one guy's hands with the celtics you get an open three they, they, they want to take 45 threes to 50 threes a game and against this kind of defense you, you can't stop it and so if you're going to single cover them you lose because Jalen Brown and Tatum will beat you off the dribble. Uh, and if you're going to blitz them, they move the ball better than anybody uh, in the NBA. And, and they've just uh, run rough shot. Now, again, you're going back to Dallas. It'll be a more hostile crowd. I, I can't see Boston losing more than one game. They may lose one game in Dallas, come back here in Boston and win game five and win the NBA championship uh, and add another championship to the Boston Celtics. This will have its own legacy with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, but the role players they have have been fantastic. You know, they, I've never seen uh, a team bring two white dudes off the bench that contribute to an NBA title. I've seen one. I haven't seen two. And they bring Hauser and Peyton Pritchard off the bench, and, they, and these guys you know, play out of their minds. <laughs> I just don't, I don't get it. But anyway, I, I salute to the Boston Celtics. All right, let's move on to Caitlin Clark being left off. The USA Olympic team. Oh, my God. You might have think that she got shot in the middle of uh, 42nd Street Square. Uh, let, let's add perspective to this. People, see, here's the problem with casual sports fans. They don't really read the landscape of what this is all about. Now, Team USA has 12 players on it that are better than Caitlin Clark. Okay. And people say, well, they would have, you should have put Caitlin Clark on for the draw. For the draw of what? She was going to be a deep bench player. Well, you're going to, you're going to tune in because Caitlin Clark's sitting on the bench? Do you not realize that this has nothing to do with the WNBA? It's the U.S. Olympic Committee that picks these teams. And they go, well, right now she's just not as good as the players we're going to have on this team. She'll get her day. There's nothing political about it. There's no persecution of Caitlin Clark not being on this, this U.S. Olympic team. People think that they're, they're trying to hose Caitlin Clark, that she needs to be on the Olympic team and she's going to dominate. The, she's not going to dominate the Olympic team. She's not. The, 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 the players, I've told you a hundred times, these are grown women that play in the WNBA. They have a lot more experience and toughness than Caitlin Clark has at this particular moment. She was a, good, a dominant, legendary college player coming into the WNBA. That doesn't mean she's the same status in the WNBA. Nobody's picking on Caitlin Clark because she wasn't named to the Olympic team. And she should know that better than anybody. She said it fueled her. Fueled her? You're going to buy into the whole thing? So far, she's been really good about staying away from that kind of thing. But you know, she added something. Uh, it fueled me. Oh, I, just got, I got snubbed. You didn't get snubbed. Your day's going to come on the Olympic team. Right now, you're kind of a frail girl who's feeling your way into a, a, a grown woman league. So I, I, I'm just I'm just tired of this uh, this this back and forth with it. Read the landscape, folks. Read the landscape. Do I believe there's jealousy and racism towards Kaylin Clark? Yes, I do. But when it comes to this Olympic situation, it's not the same issue. 
It's not anybody picking on her to keep her off the team. But even if there was, if you remember days of the dream team, where Michael Jordan said, I don't want Isaiah Thomas on the team. Maybe the players that have, have that kind of clout, maybe they made it really plain that we don't want the sideshow of her to interrupt our mission to win gold. And that's fair. There'll be a time when she has the status to be one of the top five players on that floor in the U.S. Olympics games. But it's not now. All right. Let's move on. The NHL playoffs. Happy the Florida Panthers, Stanley Cup champs. The, the, the Flyers are here picking their rear end for the last day. The Florida Panthers, of all teams, are going to win Stanley Cups. It just doesn't compute to me, right? That they've been able to build a franchise in freaking Florida. And here, where hockey has, has pretty big legs, and, and we're in this kind of a situation. But anyway, did you see who scored two goals for the Panthers last night? Uh, is a Darren. former catcher for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, right? Yes. Yvonne Rodriguez, the former catcher <laughs> for the te- Texas Rangers. Pudge, who now has moved on to hockey. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, hockey people here. Oh, excuse me? Oh, that's, oh, that's not Oh, that's not Pudge. Uh, uh, it's not Pudge. It's Evan Rodriguez. I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought that Pudge had lost a lot of weight and got on skates and, uh, and joined the Florida Panthers. He was a he good athlete. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was mistaken uh, about that. So it was Evan Rodriguez for the Panthers that scored two goals. And it looks like the Panthers are going to win the Stanley Cup. All right, it's time for Unleash. I got a lot to say in Unleash. I'm going to blow a gasket today. I've already uh, um, I had these emotional outbursts uh, on the, the Mike Masnelli podcast today. And uh, yeah, I, I, know you're saying, I know what you're saying. You're saying, you know, it's like the old days when he was yelling and screaming on the radio and he was out of control trying to get his point across. I kind of feel that way now even though I'm at a calmer time in my life. That'll close it down for today's Mike Missinelli podcast, sponsored by Bet Rivers. You can get me on email, mike at mikemiss.com. Uh, you can get a Cameo shout-out. Just go to cameo.com, and I'll give you a personal shout-out. Just put my, uh, type my name in there. You'll get all the information. Uh, and on Twitter, it is Mike Miss. Two, five. Uh, everybody have a great rest of the day. A little cloudy out there today. We'll be back at the end of the week with another Mike Missinelli podcast. For Darren, I am Mike Missinelli. Thanks for listening. Tell your friends and neighbors. Subscribe to this pod for free. Wasn't today's entertaining? Hey, for free. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.